this morning. They must be afraid of that storm. <laughs> Debbie is on her way. So, what are you going to do? All right. Oh, there, here comes the Galloway gang right now. Praise the Lord. All right. Good to have everybody here this morning. As we're continuing our doctrine classes, and we were talking last week about the preservation of the scriptures and the importance of it, the power of it. We're going to continue with that thought, but from a little bit of a different approach. As we've been talking about Bible 101, the inspiration of God breathing in his word, and then the preservation of God, those kind of merge one over the other where God has obviously used his Holy Spirit in translators down the road, but there is a, a, a distinction between inspiration and and then preservation, and then preservation will overlap a little bit with translation. Those are the three main points we're talking about in the beginning of this series with the Bible, the inspiration, the preservation, and the translation. So this morning we're going to continue in the thought of the preservation of God's Word that we this does not contain God's words. This is God's Word. We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. And last week we were out soul winning. Brother Dale and I were soul winning together. And uh, we went to knock on this guy's screen on his uh, garage. And we walked up. His whole garage was a big screen. And you could see him sitting in there at his computer and they're watching TV. And this guy was drinking. You could see some hard liquor right there. And typically when I'm out soul winning, if somebody's drinking, I just, you know, you have a good day. Watch this video because it's hard to battle with the spirits. That's what they call alcohol, spirits. And so when you're trying to preach the gospel to somebody and they're overcome of wine or liquor, the spirits are going <laughs> to usually win in their heart and their mind. The devil will pull that seed out of their mind. This guy in particular, though, after saying things and he would agree and then he would shift and back and forth, I said, do you believe that the Bible is God's word? And he said, absolutely I believe what it says. And because of that, I was willing to tarry a little longer with him. If he had said, oh, I don't know, men have written it, and who knows, what, what, what about the books that are missing, and aren't there some contradictions or things missing, and what about the differences in the genealogies? You know, if he went down that path, I would have just said, sir, you have a good day, we'll see you later, watch that card, come visit the church, whatever, right? Because he wasn't sober. <clears throat> But he did say, I believe that that's God's word and what it says is true and that's the foundation of my faith. And so I tarried with him a little longer up until the point where it became striving. And look, if you're trying to preach to someone and get them saved, if they won't agree that this is God's word, more than likely you're not going to be able to continue. You're probably just going to have to rebuke them and go on your way or give them a really good verse and challenge them that they can take God at his word. That's often what I'll do with an atheist. And I said, well, how do you know what it says? If you haven't read it and you don't know what it says, you know, take the, take the Pepsi challenge. Don't tell me Coke's better, but you've never tasted Pepsi, right? And I try to challenge people. And I'll, you know, I'll even say, take, I want you to challenge God. And some people get scared of that. And take him at his word. And you open it up and read the book of John and say, God, if you're real, you prove yourself to me through here. That's one challenge you can do for somebody that's not so sure. Still, we give people verses out of it, even if they don't believe it's His Word, because the Holy Spirit will bear record in their heart that what we're saying is true, and it's God working in their heart through the power of His Word. And I want to talk about preservation this morning, and the greatest thing that you can do to prove God's Word is to trust Him that you have his word, to just simply trust him. You can take him at his word even when you don't understand everything that is said. Allow me to open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much and I love your word and I know you tell us in Psalm 138 that you have magnified your word above your name. Lord, I pray that as we look at some scriptures this morning that you would use it to strengthen our faith in you and in what you've said, that you love us and you want us to have the truth. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the seeds of truth that are in our heart. I pray that you would help us to grow in our faith, both in you for salvation, but in your word for our daily walk. 
Lord, I love you and I ask these things right now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to learn and discern and grow by what we see today. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. If you will, go to James chapter 1. If you will, go to James chapter 1. I want you to expect God's Word to be perfect, and I don't want you to be surprised when you find out that it is truly perfect. I want you to adhere to what you hear. I want you to be willing to say what He says is right and good and true, and it's powerful, and it's perfect, and it's exactly what I need. As you're on your way to James chapter 1, if I could get a couple young men to help me with some handouts. Thank you, sir. Got a handout for everybody there about the doctrine of faith in the preservation of the Bible. Not just the preservation of the Bible, but our faith stands in God's promise to preserve it, to keep it throughout the generation. Now, you're in James chapter 1. Look with me, if you would, down at verse number 23. James 1, 23, for if any be a hearer of the word. That means you hear what it says. And not a doer. He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now today we have a lot of hearers that are not doers. Uh, we, we broadcast our sermons on YouTube and we get a lot of online hearers, online listeners, but not all of them will do what it says. Many will just, well, that's not for me, or oh, I'm not ready to make that jump, or even people when you preach the gospel, they'll hear it, but they won't do it. They hear the promise of God that salvation is freely available to all, that he died for the sins of the world, but many will not transfer their faith and stop. Tr they stop trusting in yourself, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's paid for it all. That is necessary. But here in James, this is written to those that are already saved. And he says, when you hear what God says to you, you need to do what he says. Just as a child with a parent. I often tell my children a job half done is a job not done. Children have a duty to their parents. That's to answer and to obey. When God tells them to do something, they need to respond in respect and honor. And then they need to do what he says. They need to answer and obey. Verse 23, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. You go and look in the mirror. Verse 24, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You go and look in the mirror, and you're like, Oh man, am I ugly. i got to fix that. My hair is a mess. I need to brush my teeth. And what is that sticking out of my ear? You say, Ah, forget about it. I'm just going about my day. I'm heading to church, right? I can tell nobody... Uh, is guilty of that today. Everybody's hair seems to be in order, so you check the box. You're doing good, right? But think about what he's given that illustration. You look in the mirror and you do something. Well, when you look in the Word of God as a mirror, do something when you see it. Now look what he says in verse 25. This is our church verse. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If you want God's blessing in your life, when you look into the Bible, do what it says. It's that simple. But notice, you know, he says be a doer of the word in verse 22 and a doer of the word in verse 23. He says the engrafted word in verse 21. In verse 18, he says the word of truth. And he gets to verse 25 and he says the perfect law of liberty. And let me ask you in your heart right now, do you believe that God's Word is perfect? That definition doesn't just mean flawless, it means complete. We have the whole thing, it's right here. It is perfect, it is complete, it is flawless, and it's for you. Every word is for you. <coughs> Naomi, would you get me a glass of water, please? On your sheet of paper here, again, you notice we're focusing on Matthew 1.1. This is our guide over the next several weeks, the book of the generations, the book of the generation, rather, of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And this morning, we're going to talk about the doctrine of faith and the preservation of the Bible. I want to strengthen your faith in God's Word, and I want to, I want to encourage you what the Bible says about having faith in God's Word. It's perfect. We believe that. We know that. We stand on that. We come to Him in full assurance, not in doubt. 
in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So he said, when they preached out of the Bible, they said, yeah, that's God's word. We'll receive it. That's not just man's opinion. It's not a private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He said, that, boy, that is it. That is the source of truth. That's what we need. And because they came in faith, believing it was God's. Notice what he says in that last line. It says, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It is effective in your heart, working in your mind, because you come to the Bible, the Scriptures, in faith, trusting that that's what God has for you. Thank you. If someone is willing to believe that God loves them enough to write them a book, then they can begin to understand the things, the spiritual truths that are contained therein. This book is a spiritual book. Listen, if they won't receive the Word of God, they have a bigger faith problem. They can't believe in the Christ of the Scriptures if they won't receive the Scriptures. How can they receive the Savior if they doubt the account of the Scriptures that God spoke for us? And I encourage you in this verse here because your confidence in the Bible will help you overcome when you are tried or challenged with hard questions about the Bible, whether it be its authorship or preservation, the translations, or even those false accusations about it's missing or they've added things. And hey, there really is a conspiracy to change the Bible, okay? And it's called the NIV, the ESV, the NLT, and we can go right. I mean, there's literally over 400 translations. One sermon, I had a list of 600 different versions of the Bible, and I read I don't know, 50 or 60 of them off of that list. It's just crazy how often man produces a new work so that they can put their stamp on it for the money. This one's mine, and this one has my name and my patent, my copyright, and my benefit and profit. The problem is you have to change something, a certain percentage, to be able to make it yours. But when you go about to change God's Word, that means you're not coming to God's Word in faith. This often is the danger in many of the footnote Bibles. Many of the footnote Bibles or the study Bibles where they have things to say down below, many times they are flawed and wrong and incorrect with error. And they want to plant that poison in your mind that what the Scriptures say is not what it says, that it means something different and you're just too ignorant to understand because you don't know the original language or you don't know the history of what the Catholic Church councils have decided. Forget all that stuff. Believe in God's Word, that it's true and for you. The Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all truth. Notice also Hebrews 11 now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You can't carve an idol and tell me that that created everything. That makes no sense. We serve the invisible God, and He reveals Himself in our hearts through His Spirit and through His Word. And it's through faith we understand these things. We come to the Bible in faith, believing that He wants us to know. He tells us elsewhere to add to your faith. Boy, salvation is easy. You start with faith. And he says, now add to that faith and begin to walk by faith. Not just what you see, but by what the Holy Spirit will lead you to believe. I always think of the man. Do you believe? He said, all things are possible if thou believest. He said, Lord, I believe. Oh, help thou mine unbelief. What a statement. Of course I believe you. Oh, but I'm struggling. Help me. Eliminate these doubts. Help me to believe. And he will. He will. Notice verse 6. We, we're going to see this childlike faith. Look at verse 6 there. Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you come to the Bible with the attitude, 
I don't know anything but what this says, and this is true. I, I know that God's real, and if this is to be His Word, and I believe He exists, He's made Himself apparent to me, I'm going to look in here to find Him, and I believe I'll find Him. When you come to God, you must believe that He is. He exists. He is real. And He wants you to find Him. Anybody that comes searching for God, they can find Him if they do it by faith. Childlike faith. Well, 1 John 5, 7 wasn't in all of the Bibles. You know, maybe I don't have that technical answer, but I'm going to take it by faith because it's in this Bible that's not missing any versions, any verses, or there's no corruption. There's an answer to that. There's an answer to that. The Catholic Church has been corrupting Scriptures for generations and generations and generations, and now they're the majority, and they're the critics, and the critics say, well, yours isn't like ours, so yours isn't good enough. Well, I may not know the technical answer to that, but I'm going to take it by faith that these three are one. He tells us that of God. That's a great verse for the Trinity. I know the word's not in there, but that concept where God said, let us make man in our image. We're told that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. And then here he says, ah, the Father, the Son, the Spirit. That makes sense. I can believe that. That's true. He's telling us something about his nature. And even if you didn't have the whole book of 1 John, you can still find those truths in many other places. And it's not just about the mental ascent of the facts. Let me tell you something. If you had a John and a Romans, and that's it, you're on an island, but you're saved, that Holy Spirit of truth that's inside you, it says that He will lead you and guide you into all truth. And I believe that as you're confronted with issue, the issues of life, that you can make decisions that would please the Lord as the Holy Spirit would reveal things to you in the Spirit. I thank God for His perfect Word. People have all these criti criticisms. Well, the Masoretic text versus the Septuagint. Do you know the technical answer? We're going to get to that, and there is an answer, but most people can't. Well, I don't know. Oh, they said that we got the wrong one. What's going on? Have no fear. Take it by faith. Stand on the Word of God. God's given us a perfect book. People will say, oh, well, King James, he was gay. What? Where did you get that from? King James was a Freemason. That's the other one. Couldn't, didn't God use Pharaoh? Didn't God use Nebuchadnezzar? He called my servant, he called him. Didn't God use Balaam? Didn't God speak through a donkey? Man, that means if God really wanted to, he could speak through like Obama or Biden or any of those political jokers. Man, oh man. Boy, God is good. He wants us to have his word. He wants us to trust his word. If you had just John and Romans and you're saved and you have the Holy Spirit, you're better off than a textual critic and scholar that has an NIV. They know nothing without faith in God and his book. I want to strengthen your faith. Look at, ver at Proverbs 1 here, verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity and scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? This is the world. They don't want the truth. Verse 23, turn you at my reproof. When the Holy Spirit corrects you, you need to turn it around. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. Look at this. I will make known... My words unto you, because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. He says, you're making mistake when you reject the word of God. You're making mistake when you reject the Holy Spirit. He's given us a perfect book, and most people just simply won't even open it. The Christian duty is to be in the Word every day. And that's hard. Well, we live such a fast-paced life. There's a distraction every minute, isn't there? But God's telling us that our strength comes from His book. Learning His words and His ways and looking into that mirror, that perfect mirror, the law of liberty. Looking at it and, and saying, okay, Lord, show me what to fix and I'll do it. Help me to fix myself according to your words. That Holy Spirit is our leader and our guider and our comforter. Again, He wants to draw us to the truth. 
on your sheet there, look at James 4, verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. And now many people will not come to the Scriptures because of pride. There's a famous scholar online, and he, he has studied, and he's a doctorate, and I know everything now about the Bible. He's so arrogant. He's one of these guys, if it started raining, he would drown because his nose is so far up in the air, right? And he has these lists of complaints about the King James Bible, and he's constantly trying to take away people's faith in the King James Bible, but his arguments are flawed, straw men that are easy to knock down. He's coming at the Word of God saying, this is not the Word of God, and this is not perfect, and we can't hold God's Word in our hand. No one really knows what the truth is, and it's all changed, and it's been lost, and it's been corrupted. Well, that's what he's doing is he's trying to corrupt it. He's a scoffer. He's a doubter. Through his arrogancy and pride, he says, you can't trust the Bible. You can't even understand it. That's his big argument. You can't. Oh, these words are so confusing and hard to understand. Really? Look what he says, James 4, verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I want to encourage you not to be double-minded when it comes to the Word of God. Just submit to it. Well, this is it, and what it says. Who's in charge of the church here? Right here. It's not me as a man. The men of the church, we work together in unison and we hold this up as the standard and what it says we must do. And look, I know there are things that are hard to understand or even mysterious, especially when you get into the end times and other things. And it's like, well, we can have an opinion. But the things that are clear, the things that are easy to understand, those we stand on in great confidence in God's word, what he said he means. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God's not going to trick you or deceive you. He's not lying to you. He wants you to know the truth. And most of us are too arrogant to reach out and take it by faith. I want to encourage you, take it by faith. Believe it. In 1 Corinthians 2, he says, "...which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The unsaved man cannot understand the spiritual promises of God. They don't understand the simplicity of the gospel. They want to uh, complicate it and confuse it and add their own hand to their own saving. Well, I know I'm going to heaven because I've been pretty good. Shame on you. When you get to heaven, you can't get up there and say, God, I've earned it. Well, I know I'm here because I've been pretty good. When we get to heaven, we're going to fall on our face and weep. And we're going to be very thankful for the gift of God, which is eternal life. Our spiritual weaknesses in life are directly correlated to our faith in the Scriptures and our usage of God's Word. Our weaknesses spiritually are because we're not using God's Word or believing God's Word. We're not using the greatest tool that He's given us. John 6, on your sheet, look at this, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I want to remind you what he's saying here. When you're coming to God, he's not going to deflect you, confuse you. Think about it. When you come to God through his word, when you're coming to God, he wants you to have the truth. He does. He doesn't want to complicate things and make it hard for you to understand. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom as you ask Him. You'll hit something complicated or confusing, and you just got to say, Oh, Lord, make it clear to me. Give me understanding, Lord. Give me a spiritual understanding of this text. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me. Shall come unto me. And that's not speaking, that's not a Calvinistic statement. The Calvinists will like to use that. 
Well, God gave him to him. No, what it's talking about, those that believed. Think about where Jesus in John 6, there were many that were saved under the old covenant. They were receiving the promises of the Father. And when they met the Messiah, that was the Father saying, Here, take these that are already under the covenant. Those were the ones that had already came by faith, especially when you look in context of that dialogue. But continue in verse 38. For I came, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. This, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. When you come unto the Lord, he won't cast you out. The, the, the drunk I was talking about from last week, we were preaching the gospel to him, and that was his hang-up. Well, you got to do God's will. And we showed him this verse. Now, according to the Bible, what is God's will? That we would believe in Jesus. That's correct. And then two minutes later, he said, well, you got to live good and treat others right and try to keep the Ten Commandments. And it's like, that's not how you get saved. Hey, that's how you should live, but that's not how you get eternal life. He will not cast us out. He tells them, search the scriptures, right? That's where salvation's at. Find God's will for salvation first, and then everything else will fall into place. Finally, in John 7, they're on your sheet. Verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. How awesome is this? Listen, what's the will of the Father? That we would believe on the Son. Hey, you do the will, and then when you come to the Scriptures, He will make known His Word. Do you understand that? Once you're saved, now you can discern spiritual things. You're no longer just in the natural man. You know what the natural man can do? John MacArthur unsaved heretic that tells people they can take the mark of the beast and still be redeemed. He says we're not saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Doesn't believe in the eternal sonship of Christ. But boy, is he a popular guy. John MacArthur, the great teacher. You know what the unsaved natural man can do? Well, he can read 10 different concordances and make his own study Bible. I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that guy and some of this and I'll mix it all together. Ha <laughs> ha! I have my own patented work. I have my own Bible I can sell with my name on it. That's the work of the natural man, the unsaved man. And yet he cannot discern the most simplest concepts, the simplicity of the gospel. He says it's by works. Well, it's all by grace, but God gives you that grace. In other words, God will move in and he'll force you to do good works. You have nothing to say in it. And of course, if God didn't pick you, you're going to go to hell. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't choose to be saved and believe on Jesus. What? Where do you get that? Oh, from reading heretics. That's the natural man. He cannot discern the Word of God. God reveals us, reveals Himself to us through His Word. If any man will do His will, look what it says, he shall know of the doctrine. Once you've trusted in Christ, then you can begin to understand real doctrine. He'll reveal it to us. Do you believe that? Where we started... Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Do you believe you can go to this perfect word of God and get the answer to everything? First in salvation, then every other area of life. This is your source. We have to have confidence in his word. In Revelation, he also makes a promise. He says, blessed is he that readeth. You want God's blessing on your life? Okay, read it by faith. Salvation is by faith. So take the Bible by faith. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So listen to the preaching. Listen to the word of God. And he, and he goes on, he says, and do and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. There's a blessing for reading. There's a blessing for hearing preaching. And then there's a blessing, he says, if you keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. I know we've been in the end times for 2,000 years, the last days as Jesus called it. And I'm not a sensationalist. 
Oh no, this is the big one. Haven't they been saying that about the crash, mar the crash, the, the housing, oh, the housing, oh no, no, here it comes, this is the one. Yeah, right, they said that last time and they tricked everybody into selling early so the big companies could buy up their houses early. And then you feel like you got gypped because, oh man, now the price of the house went way up. I could have got more. Don't believe the news. Believe the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Read what it says. Do what it says. Be a doer of the word. Be a doer of the work. God has a plan for us and it starts with his word. And if we'll just come to his word in great faith, that every word of God is pure. All scripture is given by inspiration. Hey, and it's profitable for doctrine in every area of your life. If you'll come with that spirit, understanding God's preservation, then he'll help you overcome any obstacles or doubts or problems once you know you have the source. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. And Lord, I do love your word. I'm so very thankful for the things that you have revealed to us through it. Lord, I ask that you would supernaturally strengthen our spiritual faith in your word. Lord, I trust that we have the perfect scriptures. Now, Lord, that we know this, I pray that you would strengthen us to use the scriptures and glorify you in our life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed until the preaching hour.